um, unfortunately might have to take a leave of absence uh, if in case necessary. Uh, the sirens go off or something. So if anybody who is not from Israel um, all of a sudden sees the screens going blank, it's because we had to go to our safe room. I uh, just want to preface that and just in case you see people pick themselves up and leave. Um, so I apologize for that. Um, <clears throat> anyway, my name is Yaakov Lazar, um, founder and, and co-director, co-founder, co-director, Colin Ashamot. Um, and I'm going to, at this point, welcome everybody uh, to this wonderful webinar, which we hope you will receive many tools and understandings and uh, how to cope and how to work with your children under some trying times, whether it be war or any other type of crisis that you may find yourself in. I'm going to turn over the floor now to Shana Pagro of Epic Families, who will uh, introduce herself for a moment, as well as Epic Families and our keynote speaker at the moment. So welcome, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight to this joint effort of Epic Family and Kol Shamot. It's a pleasure working with Yaakov and Shelly. Hi, Shelly. Um, we are all working towards common goals and of helping and supporting families. And we felt that we could really join together to create an evening to bring support for parents on many different levels. Just one minute about who we are as an organization, and you'll hear from Yaakov later about the work that they do. Epic Family supports families raising children in Israel, primarily Anglo families. Epic stands for Empowering Parents and um, Inspiring Children. And we really work on both levels. We provide support to the parents, giving therapy, guidance, one-time consultations when parents aren't sure where they need help, a child is struggling, they're not really sure what to do. We work with the schools, we help people figure out schools that are most appropriate, even pre-Aliyah we do work with families. Uh, and that's one end. The children we help through a mentoring program, which is individualized one-on-one -on -one mentoring to support children, most of it being preventative work to help kids when they're little problems, little issues, little struggles to really help them out. The last thing that we are doing now currently is unfortunately due to the situation here in Israel, the war, we opened an emotional crisis center. And I do want to make you aware of that. Anybody who is struggling themselves or their children, or they know a family who needs some help and support now isn't sure where to turn, what they really need. I'm going to put our phone number and uh, email contact in the chat. And you can feel free to reach out. And we're here to help you get the best supports that you can get during this time. Uh, on that note, I'll say that we are in a very, very, very difficult time period. Uh, as parents, we have to be there all the time for our children. And we have two speakers tonight, one who's gonna speak really to the parents, Dr. Leibowitz Levy, about how to support ourselves as parents. And then um, also, secondly, we're gonna have Esther, who is going to speak to the parents about how to talk to your children. But in order for us to really be there for our children, we first have to take care of ourselves. And I am not going to speak on behalf of Stacy. I'm going to let her speak, but that's just a little mini introduction. Dr. Stacy Leibowitz Levy is a highly experienced therapist with a master's degree in clinical psychology and a PhD in the area of stress. She has a wide range of clinical skills, including expertise in the areas of trauma, complex trauma, anxiety, stress, and adjustment issues. And she works with adults, teens, and preteens. She lived and worked for many years in South Africa and then made Aliyah in 2014. In South Africa, she was an academic as well as being very involved in the field of trauma. And since she moved to Israel, she um, has continued the private practice that she had. And she also works at the Neve Family Institute in Yerushalayim, where she heads the trauma unit. She has developed numerous training courses and written many articles in the field of stress and trauma. And I believe that Stacey is very well equipped to uh, help us navigate this very challenging time. And we thank you so much for your time tonight. And I'm going to turn the floor over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shana. And uh, welcome, everyone. And uh, I want to thank Shana, I owe a debt of gratitude to Epic Families for how they helped me when I made Aliyah with my family. So I'm glad that uh, I can spread, you know, pay it forward uh, in terms of um, 
uh, being here tonight. So the, the focus of what I'll be talking on tonight is really around understanding how we as parents deal with our emotional states and the crises that we're encountering in this current situation. And uh, I hope to talk, I'm going to try and talk for about 30 to 40 minutes and leave time at the end for questions. Um, and yeah, I'm going to be doing a screen share. So I'm just, I'm, I've got a PowerPoint uh, presentation. So I'm just going to start that up. Yeah. Um, I want to thank everyone for coming, you know, for showing up tonight. I think that's an uh, amazing uh, achievement in and of its own right at this time, just to be able to kind of. Um, show up and, and devote your time to this, this particular topic. So I think that in of itself um, is an awareness that's going to be a good springboard for what we're going to be talking about tonight, which is coping tools for us in the times of crisis that we're dealing with currently. So as a starting point, I just wanted to outline what the crisis is, because I think it's important to get a sense of what is the nature of the situation we're dealing with. And I'm primarily talking to people who are currently in Israel, um, but many of these things, may, many of these points may be relevant to people outside of Israel as well. So certainly the, the, the intensity and brutality and kind of, uh, what can I say, gut-wrenching kind of um, experience of this terrible, uh, brutal attack, I think, is, is something which is playing over in the minds of all of us and serves as the basis for what has continued to be an, a, a situation of ongoing uncertainty. And that uncertainty is in regard to current circumstances. So in other words, the level of what's going to happen this evening, like uh, um, uh, Yaakov pointed out, that we have to kind of prepare for the possibility that we may have an unexpected interruption during this course of this presentation. Or the fact that we don't know, you know, if our kids will be in school next week or what kind of situation we'll be encountering next week at all. And that, of course, extends to future and the kind of broader questions around future and the uncertainty that's projected into that for us at this particular point. Another big piece of the nature of the situation, which I think is a feature perhaps of um, uh, war in the in the 21st century is the exposure to media that there's this constant barrage and possibility of finding out whatever we want in whatever form or format that we want from the media and uh, that also means that we get exposed to opinions that are toxic or perspectives which could be unsettling or further breed uncertainty and fear Part of what's happening over the course of the situation is also as a feature of this, this traumatic event is the, a loss of faith in authorities and the notion of, uh, you know, that we're protected by the state of Israel, that, uh, we, 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 that there would never again be such an event, such brutality against Jewish people is, a, is something which has really thrown people in a state of great uncertainty and great um, insecurity around trust and authorities. And perhaps that even extends to our spiritual relationships or our sense of trust in Hashem that also could have been impacted on in terms of the nature of the situation. And then, of course, there are more kind of micro-specific issues, such as the impact of this on our, on our day to day functioning. The fact that some of us may be relying economically on uh, tourism, for example, or on our fruits and vegetables being picked, or on people buying our products in a store. And suddenly, for, for parents, they're finding that they don't have the same economic kind of stability and security, going back to the issue of certainty, um, that they might have had, let's say, a month ago. Emotionally, we're also all going through fluctuations and ups and downs, and we're also dealing with these fluctuations in terms of our extended family, and that extends also to past traumatic events and how those might be triggered by, um, by the current situation. 
as well as things which aren't related to trauma but might be significantly exacerbated by this, these particular situational factors. So for example, uh, a child who struggled with anxiety pre um, this, uh, this scenario would of course, those symptoms may well be amplified. Uh, factors of families having to decide, you know, uh, do we keep a radio on over Shabbos or don't we? Do we um, do we allow the kids to go to school? Don't we? These these kinds of situations also amplify the kind of existing pre-existing familial issues, which and dynamics within the family that uh, that the family has to kind of contend with. And then, of course, as parents, we are then uh, um, having to deal with what our children's struggles are within this context. Um, for some kids, that could look like uh, missing school, really, really wanting to be at school and finding it so hard that the hours are limited or that they can only attend school on Zoom. Um, for other kids, there might be a real sense of, of terror or empathy or struggle with the actual context of the of the um, of the war, and they might, that might be the, the, the area of struggle for that child. So our children's struggles and us as having to not only contain our own emotional uh, responses, but also having to deal with our children's amplified emotional responses is a big piece of this current situation. And of course, for those families who EPIC attends to specifically, that's all in the context of having made Aliyah within a relatively recent time, spirit, time span where the issues of language, alienation, and social and academic challenges. So, and I'm sure, you know, if I were to ask for, for co other contributions of people who are, you know, our participants today, I'm sure I would get much more of a, of a, of a kind of um, uh, uh, fleshed out picture of the, the nature of the situation. So we can see that the situation's layered. It's layered in terms of um, the trauma elements, anxiety, stress elements, elements internal to the family and elements external that are impacting on the family. So uh, we, we could do a very interesting diagram around that, I think, potentially in terms of all those layers. But I think it's just, it's just we've got to recognize just what a big load we're all, we're all really having to carry at the moment. So I just symbolize that in terms of like us really being in the eye of, eye of the storm, literally, you know, really trying to hold stability whilst feeling like we're really in the eye of the storm. So the, the bulk of my speech is really going to be around how do we hold back the storm? How do we create islands or lighthouses or bubbles, all the symbolism, all that metaphorical language that could be helpful? Um, uh, what else? Uh, castles that create a sense of stability and safety for ourselves and our families. And I'd encourage you all to think metaphorically around this, to consider what metaphorical language might be helpful for you in terms of trying to consider how do I create some sense of safety whilst dealing with this onslaught from multiple angles. And so I think the first element of trying to hold back that storm is to understand the nature of the storm in terms of, in terms of its impact on ourselves. And so I'm going to enter into a, a, the, the next stage of my, my talk, which is really around understanding that impact. And while understanding that impact, that's not just a step toward coping tools. The actual understanding of impact is a coping tool in its own right. If you can start to understand and build an awareness of how this is influencing you, on how this is impacting on your thoughts, your feelings, your bodily reaction, that is an incredible awareness from which you can then function so much more effectively. So the idea of self-observation, the idea of a capacity to be able to step above and observe myself, I suppose, as symbolized for me in, the, in my choice of the kind of lighthouse there, that I'm above the storm at some level, I think is a very, very helpful metaphor. And I think is what we're really trying to achieve through all the rest of the, the, the interventions I'm going to suggest to you.
So as I said, first I'm going to go into a bit of a description and understanding of how uh, these combined stressors and traumatic events impact on us and our inner response. And then I'm going to go to specific coping tools. But as I was the point I was making before is that in, in just going to these, these awarenesses of these inner responses, we're already um, moving into the space of coping. And I suppose that's a very important thing to also emphasize because after the first slide, I don't know, I felt like switching off the computer and dropping my head to the table. <laughs> you know, it's, it feels very discouraging, but I think we really have to hold in mind how resourced and resilient and capable each one of us is individually and, and as societally, I think we, we've been blown away by the just outpouring of resources there. So this whole talk is coming from a space of recognizing how individually resourced we are and how societally and collectively resourced we are. So let's look at the inner response that we have to the series of uh, experiences that we've had in the past month. And first of all, these are just general assumptions or thoughts around those responses. All reactions are acceptable. In other words, there's a range of response that would be considered normal in the context of a very abnormal and extreme situation. So recognizing in your own inner world that for some of you, you may feel somewhat disconnected and carrying on as if everything seems relatively okay. Whereas for others of you, you might find a lot of anxiety, a lot of intrusion. We'll go into that in a lot more detail soon. The point really is, though, is to notice, accept, and allow for space um, for your own emotions, your own bodily reactions, your own experience of these events. And with that, of course, it comes the capacity to tolerate the discomfort of your reaction. So if you're feeling, for example, resentful to your kids, because I'll give you an example. Might a child who's terribly anxious and doesn't want to attend school, and you're sitting there trying to get your work done, trying to just get through your own commitments and responsibilities, and that feeling of resentment comes up. It's important at that level to recognize the validity of that emotional response in the moment. And that's essential in order for you to be there for yourself and all the more so for you to be there for your kids. Um, that you need to contain and respect and recognize your own emotional response before being able to attend to the reactions of your kids. That goes further in terms of being able to attend to in a way that feels calming and soothing. I first need to be able to self-soothe, self-regulate before I can extend myself to be available for my children. So, for example, as I'm sure Esther will get get to in her talk, I cannot have a meaningful, containing conversation with my four-year-old if I feel agitated, distressed, anxious, looking at my phone all the time. I'm going to have to do this in a, I'm going to have to be aware of and make some attempts at self-regulation before I can find myself to be a suitable container for the experiences of my children. So let's look at what happens in terms of the disruption, the impact of these multiple situations that we are dealing with. And I want to emphasize that the impact is multi-pronged and extends into our thoughts, our feelings, our behaviors, and our bodily responses. And I think it's important to emphasize the errors between these various elements, between the thoughts, feelings, behaviors, and physiological sensations, because these things feed into each other. It's a cycle, it's a spiral. So when I'm when I'm recognizing my physiological response and I start to work on it, I can impact my thoughts. When I start to focus on my behaviors, which I'll take a simple behavior, like I keep on looking at the news. Um, if I decide that I'm gonna restrict my media intake, I might find that I'm able to shift my thoughts and shift my bodily response accordingly. So this element of the cyclical nature of these various aspects that are affected by these situational stresses, I think is, is very significant and I, 
think opens up the possibility of, of working in one zone and recognizing that I can have a kind of um, domino effect or knock-on effect in other areas. So I'm going to go through each of these impacts. I'm going to look briefly at feelings and behaviors, and I'm going to focus primarily on the impact on our thoughts and on our bodily reactions. That's going to be my primary focus tonight. Okay, so in terms of behavioral impact on of, of these uh, of the current situation, and I, I think just to relate to what was said in the beginning, these 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 impacts can relate to any crisis or any overwhelming situation that a person may find themselves in. The behavioral impacts tend to be of two major categories. The one is behavioral impacts that are driven by shutdown. In other words, a, a kind of sense of withdrawal, the person going into their tortoise shell, cocooning themselves, um, shutting down, perhaps uh, Re uh, reducing their social interactions, becoming kind of disconnected, less emotionally available for their kids. And we'll see how that plays out physiologically a little bit later on as well. And then the other aspect of our behavioral response could be a more reactive behavioral response. So in other words, I'm, I'm a snappy, uh, I'm eating more, i I can't sleep, I'm kind of engaged with, with uh, other people, but I'm kind of jumping from one interaction to another. So that would be the behavioral impact. And as I said, we'll see how that relates clearly to the physiological impact quite soon. And then, of course, in terms of feelings, um, there's, of course, the primary feelings of fear, anxiety, and horror. And then there are secondary emotions, which include emotions such as guilt, and self-doubt. And these are emotions which are kind of um, reactive to our first primary emotion, um, guilt and self-doubt, emotions like that. Okay, so let's look then at the impact on thoughts. Now, in terms of how we understand trauma and the impact of, of trauma on thinking, that was kind of the, the um, seed of how we first started to consider the field of trauma and the impact. And the notion here is that all of us hold core assumptions that help us feel safe and, and connected and um, calm in our environments and allow us to engage in our environments. And these assumptions center around three areas, how we perceive the world, when everything's going okay, and we haven't had prior horrible traumatic events, we tend to think of the world as a safe place. We tend to consider the um, world as predictable. We tend to consider others as benign, at the very least, as not, not, a, not a, a threat to us. And we tend to consider ourselves as being able to cope and manage and be, be 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 able to actually function in the world. Now, when a traumatic or series of traumatic events kind of impacts on our experience of ourselves in the world, all of those assumptions are shattered or disrupted. And so where once the world was safe, the world feels unsafe and the future unpredictable. Where once we believed the benign kind of neutrality, at least of other people, we, we start to feel that the authorities cannot keep us safe. We start to think that all people are, are hostile, that people don't have our interests in mind. And in terms of our sense of self, we start to perceive ourselves as helpless, lacking an autonomy, in danger, in threat, disempowered, victimized. Okay, so that's kind of the thought process that comes along with a state of being um, highly stressed and exposed to multiple traumatic events. Now, I don't want that to sound too reductionist because I think some of us step in and out of these kinds of thought processes. Some of us may have felt this way, say, in the first week or two of this event. Or So I just want you to recognize that's dynamic and also I'm also assuming that I'm talking to resourced people. So most of us are not going to stay in the state of disruption. 
and we'll understand why we do not stay in that state of disruption shortly. Okay, so if we look now at what happens in terms of a physiological response, when things are going okay in our lives, uh, we function within, our nervous systems function within what's called the window of tolerance. And this is a concept which was uh, developed by Dan Siegel. And this notion is that our nervous systems function um, with, with where we're able to keep an optimal level of arousal, we're able to maintain a level of calm, coping, keep our thinking heads on, um, be reasonable, not get too overwhelmed by situations. However, when we are exposed to threat or stressors, as in the red dots in this, uh, in this slide, we start to shift from a state of optimal response to a situation, to a situation where our nervous system is activated. And our nervous system can be activated into a sympathetic response, where our nervous system is switched on to hyper alert, hyper arousal kind of state, or our nervous system can respond by switching off, by shifting into a freeze response, an emotionally flat response. So the hyper arousal response is typically what we call fight flight, and the hypo arousal is typically what we would call freeze or collapse. And what happens over sustained periods of uh, exposure to traumatic stressors is that the switch stays on to varying degrees. So in other words, the switch doesn't, we don't shift back into our window of tolerance as easily. We either stay switched on for longer periods of time, as in hyper alert, fight flight, our hands are sweaty, our stomachs are upset, our muscles are tight, we're agitated, aggressive, or we stay switched off in terms of how we would describe hypoarousal, where we kind of numbed, withdrawn, cocooned, shut off from the world. The other piece of what happens when we are bombarded by a lot of threat and, and, and stressors is that our window of tolerance narrows. So what does that mean? It means that the uh, experiences which we might have previously coasted through like, for example, a child refusing to get dressed in the morning, suddenly we might find ourselves becoming more reactive because our baseline level of stress tolerance is much lower. And so our window of tolerance, our capacity to function optimally, and within that functioning optimality, optimally to keep, to keep a reasoned, balanced, observing position of ourselves is greatly narrowed. So that's the physiological response. And one can see then how that would uh, filter through into our behavioral reactions, which I mentioned a little bit earlier. And these states of hyperarousal and hypoarousal are also associated with emotional states. So for example, hypoarousal is associated with shame and guilt, for instance. So understanding our neurophysiological response to stress is a very key element of being able to um, move out of and move back into the state of, of increased regulation and increased stability. Because when we are on these um, tangents of this red spiky lines, we're really destabilized and dysregulated. And what we want to go back to is that smooth sailing place. Okay. All right. So that means really that we're looking and what you're looking to achieve is how can you create more stability in your life? How can you move away from the things that destabilize and dysregulate you and move toward the things that increase the actions and thoughts that stabilize and regulate. Okay, so that's the key uh, kind of seesaw motion of what we're trying to uh, achieve when we start to cope with crises. Now, I think it's important to note that that doesn't mean you're now going to be free of uh, feeling agitated or anxious because that just wouldn't be reasonable, normal, or acceptable given the level of stress we're under both as a society and as individuals. 
So what we're talking about is we're talking about starting to understand that stabilization along a continuum. And that's what I'm trying to illustrate by the red arrow. So for example, if at the moment my level of dysregulation feels like a 10, I might want to say, well, what could action, what actions, thoughts, or uh, intentions could I undertake that would move my level of destabilization closer to a seven or a six or a five? You hear what I'm saying? So in other words, it's not helpful to say to have an expectation that I need to be able to cope, that this should be smooth sailing, because really it shouldn't be. But I can have an expectation that I'm wanting to keep as a broad principle this concept of it almost like magnetically attracting or pulling myself towards those things which stabilize and regulate and feeling magnetically repelled from those things that dis destabilize or dysregulate. And by doing that, by going towards stabilization and regulation, I'm achieving two things. I'm reducing triggers potentially, those red dots that led off, that left me off into that state of hyperarousal or hypoarousal. And I'm also wanting to expand my window of tolerance. I'm wanting to reduce my reactivity. So if I take a practical example again, like um, uh, like media, I think it's a simple, easy example and one we can all relate to in varying degrees. If I know that exposing myself to the news continuously narrows my window of tolerance, and not only that, when I read a graphic story, it it's a trigger. It, ma it makes me feel even more dysregulated. Then I might make a choice, for example, that, well, let me check the news three times a day. And let me do, let me look at the news when I'm, when it's quieter at night. So even if I'm triggered, I can breathe myself through the trigger or I can regulate myself by uh, connecting to things which are resourcing for me at the same time. So in other words, I become an active manager of the, the aspects which lead me, to me, lead me toward greater stabilization and regulation. And within that, I can then start to function within a bubble of safety. If I had to put that bubble within the center of the eye of that storm, and obviously one can do that in an imaginary world, that I could have this bubble that has looks so fragile but has the capacity to hold aside that storm, that's, that's what I'm trying to create, and that's, that's the intention I have. And that is an active intention. So what I'm wanting to actively and mindfully, consciously do is I'm wanting to reestablish and restore safety, predictability, and hope in my body, in my thoughts, in my feelings, and my behavior. And obviously, I've stated those as, as a very absolute um, construct, safety, predictability, and hope. And again, I'm just uh, stating the proviso that as much safety, as much predictability, and as much hope as I can master at this particular point. And the way I'm going to achieve that is through very simple mechanisms, really. Routine, action steps, taking active uh, uh, steps in terms of uh, um, how I want to relate to the current situation. Let me go through each of these one at a time. So routine, what I want to do is I want to keep to and maintain as much as possible the helpful, healthy day-to-day -day routines that I may have, have had prior to this event. So for example, if I started every day off with a muffin and coffee, which sounds quite nice or whatever, you know, whatever appeals to you, I want to try and maintain and establish and, and um, support those nurturing, uh, reassuring routines. That can also extend to rituals. Say, for example, I have a weekly ritual of um, uh, phoning a close friend who lives in the States that also, by the way, would overlap with connecting. Then I would want to hold on to that ritual. Or, for example, rituals would extend into davening, into 
saying Tehillim, uh, all these routine uh, kind of soothing, meaningful activities. Where and, and you can do an inventory in your own life of what are the routines and rituals which could help me move toward safety and safety, safety and stabilization. Action is another um, agent which moves against hypo arousal and also hypo arousal. Action steps mobilizing my energy if I'm hypo aroused or moving out of a state of shutdown into a state of mobilization through uh, cooking for, for soldiers, through, um, again, spiritual ways of, of action, like, for example, becoming part of a Tehillim group, uh, through all sorts of activities. There's so much going on in terms of how communities are responding to this. But I think if you see this as an intentional action of self-care in terms of restoring and stabilizing yourself, I think that's an important difference. I'm not just going to cook, to make sandwiches for the soldiers or make sandwiches for evacuees. I'm actually taking an action steps towards increasing stability and safety in my own environment by doing so. Resourcing, noticing the resources, both internal and external, which feed and nurture you. So for example, external resources could be a close friend who you see regularly. External resources could be a, a weekly exercise class that you attend. Um, the things which nurture you, which help you to feel um, empowered, those would be an example of re external resourcing. Internal resources could be your own qualities, like, for example, resilience, compassion, uh, bravery, um, self-awareness, becoming aware of your own internal capacities and resources, identifying pleasurable activities, experiencing joy, happiness, liveliness in your life, that's, uh, I think, a very key element. And also playing out in terms of connecting, maintaining and, um, and building relationships, checking in with that friend, um, emailing someone, uh, leaving a voice mes message for someone you care about. These are, these are actions that actually help shift your nervous system back into that window of tolerance. So for those of you who are familiar with polyvagal theory, the whole concept of connecting and joyful, pleasurable activity helps you sh shift back into a ventral vagal um, space. Um, for those of whom that's relevant, and makes sense too. Okay, obviously each one of these slides could be a, I could, we could go through a whole exercise here and you could do that after this workshop if you wanted to, where you try to identify elements in each of these which could be helpful to you. Specifically, what, what routines do I want to kind of enhance and develop in my life? What action is meaningful to me? I'd like to be part of that uh, shiur on a, on a Shabbos afternoon. What resources do I have? My strong relationship with my husband, that's a resource I want to build on, and so on and so forth. Okay, so then those are general, that's like kind of the general principle of what we're trying to direct, what you're trying to direct your energies towards, towards greater regulation and greater stabilization. And then obviously within that, there's specific tools and techniques that are, um, the kind of uh, uh, zone or arena of the of psychological um, understandings. And these techniques include grounding, breathing techniques, muscle relaxation, and mindfulnesses or guided visualization. And so I'm going to just guide you through one grounding tool very briefly. And then I think we'll have time to do a guided visualization. Okay, so that's my intention. And then we will, we'll, so I'll, I'll end after that. So let's understand grounding. I'm going to, I'm going to I hope to get through breathing and muscle relaxation when we actually do the visualization. 
So we're going to focus on grounding, and this technique is a combination of grounding and resourcing, and it comes from um, emotional emotion aid, which is a more of a somatic experiencing kind of um, uh, approach. And basically what this approach emphasizes it is it that it emphasizes various tools for self-regulation. The first of these tools is the butterfly tap. And this is, again, where you start to assess your level of dysregulation. The higher your level of dysregulation, the, the closer to step one you would start. The lower your level of dysregulation, the closer you would more likely start from steps four and five. So you're wanting to do soothing and self-regulating, grounding kind of exercises. So for example, the first stage is the butterfly tap, where you're literally tapping and holding, crossing your body, and you're counting to 25 as you do that, 25 times on either side. The next step is feeling your body against the back of a chair, your feet on the ground. And these are all grounding attempts that you could use at any point, especially when you're feeling highly dysregulated. Then there's another simple self-regulation tool here, which is putting your hand on your heart, one hand on your heart, one hand on your stomach, and just allowing yourself to pay attention to your breath as you do that. Step four is a, is a process of focusing on your bodily sensations, just being mindful and curious of each sensation as it comes into your awareness, allowing it to pass. And if needs be, if the sensation lingers, asking the sensation what the sensation would want to share with you if it could speak. And then the final step in this process of grounding is really looking at what resources you have. So for example, thinking of something that makes you feel good or strong or calm, whether it's considering something sweet you saw with one of your kids during that particular day, whether it's a, a, a kind of time you had together with a friend, um, those would be some of the examples. I've gone through this very quickly, but you know, feel free again to experiment with each one of these uh, methods. Some of these methods represent more resourcing and some of these me methods represent more self-soothing and grounding techniques. Okay, so for those of you who'd want to participate, we're going to do a guided visualization technique now. And I'm going to focus first on breathing. Um, for those of you who don't, obviously that's fine. Um, just uh, we're gonna we're gonna should take about three minutes uh, and then we'll open up for questions. So if you could just close your eyes and settle back in your chair and just notice your breathing. And the kind of breathing we want to do is we want to do deep abdominal breathing. So in other words, I want to take a breath in, and as I feel the breath coming in, I want to try and feel my stomach rise. I take a breath in and I take a long breath out as if I were blowing bubbles or the little spears on a dandelion. I don't know what, I don't know if that's the term used generally, dandelion, but that's what I know it as a, as a child. Where you take a dandelion and you just go and you blow all those little spores, all those little seeds off the dandelion. Okay, so let's notice our breathing. Breathing in, calm and relaxation, and breathing out any worries and concerns you may be feeling. And as you continue to breathe in and out, in and out, just allow your eyes to close if you feel comfortable to do so, and just check in with your body. Notice your body leaning against the back of the chair you're in. Feel your feet resting comfortably and just check in with your body, allowing any worries or fears or concerns to just float through you. And bring your attention to the muscles in your legs and tighten the muscles in your legs and relax them. Tighten them and relax them. And once more, tighten and relax, continuing to breathe in and out, in and out, feeling more and more relaxed. 
Now bring your attention to your shoulders and arms and tighten up the muscles in your shoulders and arms and release them. Tighten them and release them. And once more, tighten and release. Continuing to breathe in and out, in and out, feeling more and more relaxed. And as you find yourself in a state of deepening relaxation, bring your attention to the muscles in your face and tighten up the muscles in your face and relax. Tighten them and relax. And once more, tighten and release, feeling your mouth jaw and your mouth and your jaw relax and your cheeks soften. And as you find yourself in a state of deepening relaxation, allow your mind to wander to a place where you feel safe, calm, and deeply relaxed and at ease. Picture in your mind's eye this special place. Perhaps it's a place you've been to before. Maybe a place from your childhood. Or perhaps it's somewhere you wish you could have visited. And picture in your mind's eye as full an image of this place. Invite all of your senses to picture that place. Notice what you see there, the colors and images. Notice the sounds around you. Bring your attention to any textures that you may notice as you find yourself in a safe and comfortable place. And perhaps you even might become aware of certain tastes or smells. And just enjoy being here, taking in as full a picture of the safe place, knowing that you carry within you this resource. And allow yourself to linger here. And when you feel ready, return to the room, feeling refreshed and relaxed. Okay, I'm going to just because of time limitations, um, bring myself, bring us back. Um, obviously, if there were fewer time limitations, that would have been an, a more extended experience, both in terms of the pacing of my voice um, and in terms of the time you could spend there. But I, I think what I would want people to take away is that the assumption is you can find that resource state within you because almost all of us can. We all have that resource state within us. And, you know, I've done this guided visualization process in groups over the last 20 plus years. And it's always a delight. It's always quite a remarkable kind of realization to see that people hold such a resourced and soothing and comforting space within ourselves. Um, so I'd like you to be mindful of that and recognize that you have the resources and you have the capacities to uh, cope with the current circumstances. And the if directing yourselves intentionally toward uh, doing that will really make a big difference and will really allow you to be more present and calm and centered for yourself and for your families. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Thank not you, sure if I all. should direct questions, but yeah. yeah, if anyone has questions, I'm happy to answer. So Stacy, first of all, thank you. There's a question in the question and answer if you wanna read it out loud and then answer that. Can you see it? Yeah, I see it. So the question is, can you address the internal conflict between keeping a balance between my ongoing self routines and responsibilities versus the desire I have to help in the war effort? 
If I give too little to others, guilt comes up. If I give too much, I start to feel hopeless and depressed. Thank you. So, yeah, I think that's a big dilemma that many of us are facing. And uh, you feel it every day when you get a bombardment of WhatsApp group <laughs> invitations to produce things, make things, be part of Tehillim groups, be part of this group. Um, uh, so I really understand the kind of uh, internal conflict. And my sense is if you... The first step is to come from a place of self-regulation and self-care. Just as if you if you think about what I just said about how are you going to be able to be a container and a giver to your own children if you haven't yet attended to your own self-care and your own self-regulation. I think all the more so that logic applies to communities and efforts at that level. And so... I think it's important to recognize that you the, the place we begin any attempt at giving has to come from that place of self-regulation and self-stabilization. Having said that, I think the guilt issues are complex. And I've sp I think almost every person I've spoken to, um, Every client I work with, every individual I speak to, friend, family member, family members in chutzlarets, there's kind of this collective guilt, however far or close you are from this event, to want to be able to do more. And perhaps it's useful to recognize that guilt is an immobilizing emotion. It's not a mobilizing emotion. It's a, an emotion that shuts us down, that limits us that tells us we're bad. So, I, I mean, I think it's helpful to say, if I were to feel another feeling besides guilt, or if I were to respond to that guilt, enter into dialogue, but with the part of me that feels guilty, how would I respond to that part? So I think those are some strategies for addressing the, the part of us that does feel guilty, but I think that is a very alive part for many people at this point. Okay, um, I'm not sure what Debbie couldn't read specifically, perhaps the emotion aid, because that was small print. I'm, I'm assuming I will send a slideshow to Shana and she can forward it to everyone. And you can find that emotion aid slide on many, many, it's very available uh, as a resource. It's not, it's not a, re it's a freely available resource. Oh, yes, let me stop the screen share. Thank you very much. Has it been stopped, the screen share, or is it still? Okay, thank you. <laughs> All right. Anyone else uh, have a question? Are there more questions? Let me just check. Check in the chat as well. Thank you. All right. So, um, yeah, looks like that. See, it. maybe you want to just go through the five different quick regulations one more time to say them again for people since they couldn't read it. Right. I can. That was. Okay. was uh... But show the tapping because I don't think people could see you tapping. Right. Okay. So I'm going to just <laughs> do the by, by tapping because I'd rather you get one method well than get five methods poorly. Okay, so in terms of butterfly tapping, I'm going to try and move my screen a little bit. This is a very simple technique. It comes from uh, both kind of the EMDR and also the somatic, uh, somatic techniques. But the idea is simply like this. If you're feeling internally dysregulated, you're feeling anxious, shut down or overwhelmed, put your one hand here, your other hand here, you simply... You can also combine this with a statement, for example, statements that come from EFT tapping. Even though I'm afraid and anxious, I know that I will be okay. Even though I'm afraid and anxious, I know that I will be okay. Or even though I'm afraid and anxious, everything will be all right. So making a statement, the whole principle of many of these techniques is that we're not trying to erase negative feelings. We're not trying to deny 
negative feelings, but we are trying to recognize that I can be resourced and I can also feel anxious. So this kind of technique is a helpful containing physical technique, literally. Giving yourself a hug, for example, is also helpful. Literally, a physical kind of hug can be a helpful technique. Um, uh, yeah, so that, that's that's a simple technique just to do, just to keep this kind of tapping back and forth across yourself. Um, that's something you can also do with your kids or teach your kids to do. It can also be helpful in regulating and containing. And also statements of recognizing, I'm feeling anxious, I'm feeling afraid, I'm feeling guilty. Even though I, I know I'm, even though I'm feeling guilty, I know I'm doing the best I can. Even though I'm feeling guilty, I know I'm doing the best I can. I'm feeling guilty, but I know I'm doing the best I can. Okay, so those kinds of statements that hold both are very, very helpful as well. All right. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. And uh, we really appreciate your time tonight. And Yaakov, turning the floor over to you. Uh, thank you so much, Stacey. That was really wonderful. Thank you. Really appreciate the tools and uh, it's very helpful. Coping is uh, very important. Um, as we all know, that uh, in order to be there for others, you need to be there for yourself first. And it's the uh, the proverbial putting on your oxygen mask uh, first before you can help others, um, which would lead us into, I guess, Esther. There's how to be there for the others. Uh, once we now know that how to be there for ourselves. And, you know, we, it, the most important aspect of what we do as parents is to be able to um, co-regulate and be there for our children in any type of crisis that we can be. Um, again, as I think we mentioned before, crisis is, um, can happen in any in any way, in any shape, doesn't have to necessarily be a war. A crisis could be in a car accident, God forbid, or a crisis could be for a child or for anybody who loses a toy or loses something where the child all of a sudden is, is just dysregulated. Um, and when they're throwing a temper tantrum at any age, um, we have children at young ages that throw temper tantrums, and we have children in their teenage years throwing temper tantrums. And if we can use the coping skills that we've learned, that we can be there for our child during their crisis. Um, and not only for our child, but we can be there for others as well. Um, and in the second part of our talk, um, so Esther Unger, uh, who we thank very much for joining us here today, is a trauma therapist re residing in the United States. Esther is trained in EMDR, Santre therapy, Child Parent psych Psychotherapy and the Circle of Security Parenting Program. She works with clients of all ages and has significant experience working with parents and young children who have experienced trauma. The idea here is we here in Kolon Shamot, though we work as well with many families um, and, 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 and the extended families, specifically the parents, of children who are dealing with, with trauma. And we deal with the situation where children could be with an, uh, high levels of anxiety, depression, all the way to unfortunately to self-harm, such as cutting or suicidal tendencies. Um, so we work uh, mostly with Anglo families um, who are dealing with unfortunately situations like that where their children are um, where the, the the high anxiety levels that are causing either depression and, and uh, self harm tendencies, and one of the things that we try to teach and we try to put, look, you know, help others with, is in matter of prevention. Um, sometimes when the children are younger, uh, sometimes you can even do prevention when they're already inside a crisis situation. Um, here specifically, why this is being done now is more or less in terms of because of the um more in terms of the war here in, in Israel 
Uh, we'll be seeing a lot more of it where children of you being your very young children um, have anxiety issues and the exasperate and being exasperated with the war and the, the efforts and everything that's going on because everybody's talking about it. It's 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 in your face. Unfortunately, we have situations where the sirens are going off. And even when the sirens don't go off, we do hear explosions sometimes in the air, uh, which could cause an anxious person to just jump and um, be out of things. So the question is, how do we talk to our children, our especially our younger children? What information can we give them so they can feel, which is so important and something that we at Kol Shabbat, you know, try to give over to many people, learning it from Rav Shimon Russell and many others, where we talk about being safe, secure, seen, and soothed. How do we give over to our children to make sure that they understand that we they are as safe as possible within our realms? How can we show them that we see them and that we hear them? And Esther, thank you for joining us. And uh, I'm going to turn the floor over to you and let you go for it. Thank you so much for joining us. Hey, thank you for having me. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Um, I know Dr. I see Dr. Lee Boslavi had to hop off, but um, I so appreciated um, her presentation. And it was a really nice way to start out. I know it's a lot um, for all those of you who are on the previous hour. Um, do whatever you need to do. Just stand up, stretch. Um, I know this is a lot in intense conversations. So I'm going to be sharing my screen in a moment. Um, so I'm going to be focusing today on thinking about supporting young children, talking with them. And when I was creating the presentations or the child that had in mind is young children. So gone age, early elementary school age children. Really everything I'm presenting applies to children of all ages, adults, we're all human beings. Um, but there are a couple of things that are specific to younger children because they're still developing. Right? Their brains aren't functioning sort of the way where our adult brains are. So there are some things that are different, um, which is why I'm going to be focusing on young children, but so much of this is relevant to children of all ages. And also I had in mind children living in Israel, um, but of course there's, you know, this can be relevant to children living in other places as well and in other crises as well. So with that, I'm going to share my screen. So when we think about supporting and talking to our young children. So the first thing, and Dr. Leibowitz Levy spoke a bit about this, but I think a really important way to frame this entire conversation is this quote by Viktor Frankl. Some of you might be familiar with him. He was a Jewish psychiatrist, a Holocaust survivor, who wrote a very influential book called Man Search for Meaning. And he said, an abnormal reaction to an abnormal situation is normal behavior. I think that's really important to remember for parents and for children. What's going on now in Israel, what's going on for the Jewish community worldwide is abnormal. So if an adult or a child, if any of us is having a reaction to that, that's normal. That makes sense that there might be a strong response in a child. In an adult, it doesn't mean that there's a problem. It doesn't mean that there's anything crazy about you or your child if you are having or you or your child is having an abnormal reaction. Um, however, it's helpful to hold in mind some of the common responses, and some of these are similar to adults, and some of these um, are a bit different for young children. So I want to go through this list. This is not in full list. There could be other responses as well. These are just common stress responses in young children, and you may recognize some of these in your children. So really common one, the younger the child is, I think the truer this is, is that changes in biological functions. So thinking like sleep, eating, toileting, and sleep being a big one, that you see changes. So a child's having a hard time falling asleep, staying asleep, changes in eating, toileting, particularly for kids who are recently toilet trained. And this brings us to our next one of what the loss of previously acquired skills. So another really common one for young children is that they may lose some developmental skills that they've had, particularly if they recently acquired the skill. So a child who recently toilet trained, recently stopped sucking their thumb, et cetera, that they seem to be regressing. And this is common. 
Increased aggression or moodiness is common as well. Increased anxiety, particularly around separation, is common. And for some children, separation can mean you go to the next room, you go to the bathroom. But certainly bigger separations, a child going to school, parent having to leave the house for work, and there's increased anxiety. Um, Hyper-focus and safety and danger. So this is where a child is very focused on safety and danger beyond what's actually right, what was actually needed for safety. So this might be a child who's very anxious, like we can't open the front door, it's not safe. So this is not grounded in the reality of safety, um, like what's actually safe and dangerous in the community in that moment. This is really hyper-focus on it. And then general fears that extend beyond the traumatic experiences. So you may have a child developing fears that really don't seem to be related in any way to everything that's going on. And that's common too. Their common response is repetitive play themes or conversations related to the traumatic events. So a child who's talking again and again or playing about it, and we'll talk a little bit about the role of play for young children. Um, so playing or talking about the trauma like again and again. Um, increased somatic symptoms without a medical cause. So a kid who, or this is not where they're actually sick, you've ruled out anything medical, but they're constantly complaining of headaches, stomach aches, et cetera. For kids who are a little older, difficulties concentrating in school. And this is also for older children as well. They might experience guilt or shame, particularly related to their actions during the traumatic events. So how they may have responded in a moment or how they respond in a crisis, they may feel a lot of guilt or shame, irrational. And then overall, what I tell parents is pay attention to changes in your kid from before and to now. How was your kid a month ago? How are they now? Parents know their kids best. So there might be a change in your child that to an outsider doesn't seem concerning, but you've noticed a change. You've noticed a shift in their personality. But a child who was more low-key suddenly seems to have a lot more energy. A really high-energy child is a lot more low-key. So like you're noticing a change. I think that, again, this, these all of these are common responses. They don't mean anything is terribly wrong, um, but it's very helpful to notice What's going on with your child? Because as Dr. Liebert Sleevey was talking about with adults, and the same is true with children, when we can notice our responses, that gives us insight into what we might need to help ourselves. And so the same is with our children. When we notice their responses, it gives us insight into what's coming up for them, how they might be handling things. And a really important idea to hold in mind um, when we try and understand what's coming up for children and for ourselves as well. This idea that danger reminds the body of danger. So really simple um, and a really key idea of how our brains and our bodies function. So we are wired for survival and for optimal functioning. So each time we enter a new situation, our brains, this happens automatically, unconsciously, really quickly. It scans all our previous memories to determine, have I been in a similar situation before? And if we've been in a similar situation, we compare the two situations and say, okay, I've been here before. I know what to expect, right? I know whatever lessons I learned. How do I behave? How do I respond? How do I expect the people around me to respond? If you think about the first time you took a really young child, a one-year-old, two-year-old to a very stimulating environment, it could be positive, an airport, an amusement park, a busy mall, whatever it was. And the child is completely overwhelmed, completely overstimulated, right? Not handling it very well. You take that same child to the same situation a couple of times, and now I'm overstimulating is inherently an airport is overstimulating, but the child sort of gets a general gist of what to expect because our brain is scanning past memories. And so the same is true when we are in a scary situation. So when there is an experience such as now, when there is danger, when there is fear, when there's loss, there's traumatic loss. All of us, our brains are automatically scanning and saying, have I been here before? And the thing with this scanning, again, because it's for optimal functioning, it's very broad scanning. So it doesn't mean like I've been in this exact situation before. If there's anything that seems similar, a person's brain is remembering it. So a child who's been through trauma that has nothing to do with the war, a child who's experienced abuse, who witnessed violence, like within... I mean, their home or school, right? Nothing really, nothing related to the war. Maybe having a stronger response, maybe struggling more. A child who experienced loss that had nothing to do with the war. 
may be having a stronger response because their brains have associated the past danger, the past loss with the current loss. So that's just important to hold in mind as you think about which children might be having a stronger response, might need more support. Okay. So the bulk of our conversation is going to be how to support kids. And I think a really important question um, to answer is, why are we focusing on providing support? We can't change the crisis, right? We can't change what happened. The past couple of weeks, we can't change. We have no ability to change what's going to happen. And um, so listening to a couple of weeks ago, I was listening to this presentation by Avi Tenenbaum. He lives in Israel and he um, is trained in, does trainings in psychological first aid, which is how to help people in crisis. And he asked this exact question. I thought he had a really nice answer. So he defined trauma as simply an event that overwhelms a person's internal coping skills and their external supports. So trauma is something, right? Bad, scary that happens and the person doesn't have internal coping skills and doesn't have the supports around them. And that inherently makes it trauma because it's so overwhelming. So with that, if we hold the idea that's what trauma is, then if we can provide support to help a person have better internal coping skills, so if we can give our kids more internal coping skills, if we can strengthen their external support, strengthen our relationship with them, then they're better able to cope. Inherently, if they're better able to cope, they'll find it less overwhelming. So we're not changing the uh, events that are happening around us, but we can change how overwhelming we and our children find the situation. Okay. So with that, I'm going to move into how to support your kids. The first thing Say if there's one thing you take away from this, um, it's really everything Dr. Lee Woods lady spoke about, regulating and taking care of yourself. There's so much research that shows that children are only as regulated as their parents. Children, because their brains are still developing, they don't really have the ability to regulate on their own. And so getting your own support is really the best way to support your child. Taking care of yourself is the best thing that you can do for your kid. So all of those practical techniques that Dr. Lee Slavy was talking about, figuring out which ones resonate with you, figuring out how to incorporate those in your daily life, that is the best thing that you can do for your child. And then there are going to be moments where you're really overwhelmed, really scared, really angry, really sad. And so if possible, this may not be possible, but if you do have the ability to step away from your child, have someone else care for them, it can be really important. Because when a child, when a parent is very, very overwhelmed, that can be frightening and confusing for a child. So if you have that luxury, it's definitely something to use. Okay. Next, talking to your kid about what's happening. So we talk to parents about, you know, speaking to their children around crises and many different types of crises. The questions people sometimes ask, and the younger the child is, the truer this is, is why should I talk to my kid? Right, I'm not telling them anything good. How do I explain this to a three-year-old? Why don't why does my five-year-old need to know whatever it is? And so the truth is, certainly at this point where we're holding four weeks into everything, kids are ready now. They know from their older siblings, their neighbors, their friends, social media, but they very likely have inaccurate information. So they'll know half stories, half truths, they'll have they won't understand what was told for them, what was told to them. And so it's kind of all mixed up in their minds. And then even if a child somehow at this point doesn't know, it wasn't told anything, kids sense changes in their parents' moods and behavior. They're going to notice. They're going to notice that their parents are different. And when there are changes and children aren't told, they're not explained what happens, they fill in the blanks and they create a narrative. The narrative that they create is often worse than what's happening in, rea in reality or places inappropriate, inaccurate responsibility on themselves for the traumatic events. So they'll blame themselves in completely inaccurate ways. So just as an example, I was working with a young girl who had lost a sibling of hers and she blamed herself because she, she was a very energetic child and would sometimes like disturb the sibling while you're resting. And she blamed herself because of that. The reality was here was complex medical situations. And when 
um, you know, we were able to, myself and her mother were able to sit down and talk to her and explain in a child appropriate way that nothing to do with you. Right? So this child was carrying around the skill that nobody had any idea about. She thought she had killed her sibling because she was acting like a child. And some sort of version of placing inappropriate blame on themselves is very common in young children. And so it's so important that we talk to them, that we explain to them what's going on, and that it's not their fault. <laughs> so with that, what do you tell your child? So as a general rule of thumb, what I like to think about when speaking with children about hard topics is we share the least amount of information possible that will help our child have an understanding of what's going on. Now, the least amount of information might be a lot, right? So depending on where, what other sources your child will hear from. If your child is number seven in their family, if you have neighbors, right, you live in a neighborhood in a building that's really close and your child has a lot of contact with other kids, if your child's back in school at this point, they're going to be hearing a lot more. You're going to need to be sharing more information with them versus a child who doesn't have any older siblings, maybe a younger child, who even though they're back in school, will not be hearing as much in school. So whatever that least amount is, is very much going to depend on the child. But in general, that's the basic approach they really come from. That we want to share the least amount that will help them understand what's going on. And something else to think about is that different aspects might need to be shared with kids depending on where you live in Israel. Right, right now, families who were living in the South and had to evacuate, having a very different experience than families who are living in Beit Shemesh. A child who has a father or another loved one in the IDF and a child who doesn't have some a loved one in the IDF is having a very different experience. So depending on what experience your child is having, you may need to share different information. And then finally, I think this is and the hardest piece of this all is we can't make promises to kids about things that are out of our control. We want to tell our kids that they're going to be safe, that we're going to keep them safe, that the world is safe. And we wish we could tell them that, right? but we don't have control over that. And it's very tempting to promise kids these things. The problem is twofold. Firstly, if we promise our child that something won't happen, and unfortunately it does, we have broken like the trust that the child has in us in really significant ways. And that is, that would be a big concern. And the other thing is, I think the older your child is, it sure it is, and even young children have a sense when you make promises you can't keep, they're going to know it. Sometimes kids might even ask. A parent might say, this isn't going to happen. They might say, how do you know? And we don't. And I think that's important that we don't make promises to kids. We say, we can say things that probably won't happen. We can highlight what we're doing to keep ourselves and them safe. But we can't promise things that we don't know. It is important because we can't make those promises for ourselves, for our children to hold space for that unknown, to acknowledge the anxiety, the fear that everyone feels when we don't know these things. And at the end of um, slides, I'll be sharing some specific examples of specific language that people can use to how to actually have conversations with kids. Okay. So now how to tell your kids. So really important, think about the most appropriate time to tell your child. So choose a time when you and your child won't be distracted, overwhelmed, tired, etc. So right, thinking about the idea that our kids are going to only be as regulated as we are. If you're in a really anxious mood, if you're in a really bad mood, you're just depressed, Probably not a great time to have a conversation with your child. I absolutely encourage you to take some of the strategies from Dr. Leibowitz Levy and do a couple of them before you talk with your child. So making sure you're in a regulated space and also that your child is. Um, maybe don't do it right before bed if you want to talk about something hard. <laughs> them right laying in bed for hours um, thinking about it. We don't do it right during mealtime when there's lots of other people around. So thinking about just what the most appropriate time is for you and your child. Okay. Always start out by asking your kids what they already know about the situation. Again, particularly now when we're a couple of weeks in, kids are going to know a lot. A lot of it will probably be inaccurate. So we want to know what kids know. We want to know if they're blaming themselves, how they're understanding it. If the narrative itself is 
completely inaccurate. So because this is something, or again, especially after four weeks, that there's been so much information that they've been living, children in Israel from the world over have been living this for four weeks already. So they're going to have taken it all. So always start out by asking them what they know. And then use simple language that's accessible to your child's developmental stage. So for example, if you're talking to like a gun age child, rather than using the word terrorist, use words like bad people, people who made really bad choices. That'll be meaningful to a young child. A young child doesn't know what a terrorist is. But saying a bad person, saying somebody who made a bad choice, they'll understand. And in a similar vein, we want to focus on simple facts. We all have really strong feelings about what happened, what's happening, and how the world is responding. And that is understandable. But that is not necessarily something that young children can relate to. And it can get very confusing. So when we're going to um, include complexity, rhetoric, moral context, that can just be overwhelming to a child, be meaningless, or sometimes even make them more anxious. So for example, instead of saying Hamas did horrible things to people because they hate all Jews and don't believe in our right to be here, you can words, use words like people made really bad choices and hurt a lot of Israelis. A young child will be able to understand that. That'll be meaningful to them. That'll help them understand what's going on. I'll continue this in the next slide. Um, a really helpful way to talk with kids is to use books or pull language from books. So there's been seen a handful of books going around. Um, and so sometimes reading a book with a child, very often when I'm speaking with children about hard things, if there isn't a book that I love or that fits the situation exactly, I'll pull some language from a book. So that's really, um, that could be really helpful. Best you don't have to reinvent the wheel, right? If somebody has sat down and written a book, and figured out a way to explain something to young children, use that language. We're going to talk a bit about, um, in a bit about play and its role with young children. Um, so for now, I'll just say very briefly, playing out conversations with toys can be another way the younger the child is a more relatable, you know. Um, when talking with children, I think it's so important to highlight the helpers. And you may know this uh, famous quote by Mr. Rogers who had a children's television show for many years. And he said that when he was a young child, when he was watching TV, um, and there would be a disaster, a tragedy. His mother would always tell him, look for the helpers. They're always helpers. I think that's certainly the case here. And I think it's really important for two reasons um, to highlight the helpers for our children. Firstly, I think, unfortunately, we have been, the past couple of weeks, we have been exposed to the very worst choices that human beings can make. And talking about before we need to talk to children about we don't need to go into detail of course about the choices but we need to even just say that people made really bad choices and that is an unfortunate reality a really really tragic reality that we're all trying to grapple with and i think it is so important it's so easy to get lost in all the terrible choices people are making and i think it's so important for us for our children to highlight there are people that make terrible choices and there are people that make wonderful choices Right? The world is not all bad. It's very easy. In trauma, Libra Slavery was talking a bit about how trauma impacts thoughts to assume the world is all bad. Right? Everybody's going to hurt everybody. Everybody's going to fail everybody. And we need to hold that. Unfortunately, there are people that made really bad choices and there are a lot of helpers. There are a lot of people making really good choices. So I think that's important for all of our sanity. And also, I think from an empowerment perspective, because if we can hide, like highlighting the helpers can then lead into conversation to, to, with your child of what can you do to help, right? What concrete steps can they take to keep themselves safe? So, right, what can they do if there's a siren, you need to go to the mamad, can they have a special job? Whatever it might be that's appropriate for your child. So, right, something or even highlighting to them, what do you do to keep yourself safe just throughout the day? Right? Talking to them about davening, doing mitzvahs, right? different things that concrete steps that they can do to keep themselves safe, how they can be a helper. And this can help decrease feelings of helplessness, which is really important for well-being. 
And finally, it's important to acknowledge the adult's responses. And this is important. Um, so both to normalize strong feelings, right? So when we can tell a child, you know, these things happen, I'm feeling really sad about them. We're letting our child know everyone feels sad. That's really helpful. Um, it's also really important because it helps to explain changes that they may have picked up on. So if they're noticing that, or they may have noticed that you're kind of sadder, you're more distracted by your phone, you're maybe a little more irritated. So it's helping them understand, right? This has nothing to do with you. This is, I'm just having stronger feelings about this. And then when we do talk to our kids, these are some common responses um, when a child is told about afraid of it. So during the conversation, this is really common that kids will act like they haven't heard anything that you said. They'll quite literally walk away from the conversation. They'll change the subject. This happens all the time. And allow for this to happen. This very often is kids regulating themselves. And kids are interesting because in some ways, talking about earlier, they don't have the capacities that we have to regulate ourselves because their brains are still developing. On the other hand, because their brains are sort of simpler, very often children are a lot more attuned with themselves than we are. They're a lot more able to be in the moment. And so in some ways, children sometimes are better at regulating themselves. And I think when it comes to this, children have a better sense than adults do of when something's too overwhelming. And very often when a child is walking away, changing the subject, it's their way of regulating. It's their way of saying, this is too much for me right now. So allow that. Let talk about something else for a couple of minutes. Let them walk away for a couple of minutes. And then after some time, you gently re return to the, to, to the topic. Most of the time, kids are okay with that. Um, kids might not have any outward response. This is quite normal. And particularly now, as we're a couple of weeks in, you may not be telling them anything that different than what they already know. Or some kids are very focused on right here and now. Here and now, if everything is somewhat normal in their life, okay. Um, so they may not have a response, they may have a response five days later. It's very normal. And then very common, the children need small doses of information on multiple occasions and many opportunities for questions. So, you know, if you have a child that you start talking to them and they walk away and then you try and return to it and they, you know, are completely ignoring you or like they're clearly not ready to engage, say so drop it come back another day or a couple a couple of hours later. Really, this is true for even if a child seems open in the conversation, this is really true for all children, giving them small doses of information and lots of opportunities for questions. So checking in routinely, do you have any questions for me? Like, are you wondering about anything going on? So it's really important. Okay, moving on to the next way that can support children. So... Libra Slavy spoke a bit about this. I think it's really important for young children, really, really limiting their exposure to media, preferably avoiding all exposure. Um, any of us adults who are consuming any media know how overwhelming it is. And it is much more overwhelming for young children. Children often misunderstand or misinterpret information that they overhear. Avi Tenenbaum in his, his presentation highlighted a story that I think really spread out this point, saying that he had posted... Uh, something on Facebook related to the war, Israel, Hamas, and um, people read it, they liked it, and he gained some new followers. So was, he was telling his wife, I got 30 new followers. And his seven-year-old child overheard and panicked because Facebook was, didn't know what followers were, and thought that 30 people were following his father to kill him. So we see something so benign or even positive that caused a young child to panic. So all the more when the information itself is actually overwhelming, young children can often get very confused. Um, and so really, really limiting it. And that means is that it's important to be mindful of news they might overhear, adult conversations they might overhear. So when they're around, um, just being mindful of what's going on in the background. Um, the really important you know, when it comes to supporting kids is keeping routines as much as possible. And the emphasis here is as much as possible. So routines help kids regulate their anxiety because they know what to expect. So the more anxious your child, the more they're going to need a routine. It's going to be really hard if your child 
doesn't have school, if they're totally virtual, if there are a couple hours of school, if everything seems to change every day. Um, and so I would say, especially if that's the case, fo focus on even small aspects of your child's routine that can be the same. So for example, keeping structure around meal time, bedtime. If your child is home, right, if they're doing Zoom school or no school, it could be tempting to say, okay, they'll just go to sleep whenever they fall asleep, they'll fall asleep wherever they are in the house, they'll wake up when they wake up. But keeping that routine around bedtime. So you go to sleep the same time. We have our bedtime, whatever your bedtime routine is, generally when you have school, that's your bedtime routine. Um, so keeping those, even if there are small things that you can do, they can go a long way. And then in as much as possible, again, that's the emphasis here, to try and build a daily routine and stick to it. Even if it's a very loose routine, even if that routine means that, you know, in the morning we do a couple of things and then even we have a couple hours of screen time because parents need to work and child doesn't have school or you do, right. You go to a couple hours of school and then you come home and usually you'd be in school longer. And so now we right, have a very loose routine. Even that loose routine can be really helpful for young children. Next, really important is providing kids with opportunities to express their thoughts, feelings, and questions. So children, all of us, feeling very overwhelmed. And the younger a child is, the more difficult it can be for them to spontaneously talk about it. Some kids do. Many of them don't. And so it's so important to, for parents to be really mindful, to get, specifically give opportunities for kids to explore all of this. So play is a child's language. Um, young children, even if they can say all the words, as you sure you all know from your own children, can't use vocabulary, you don't have the language skills yet to express really complex thoughts or feelings and kinds of feelings that everybody's having right now. However, children are able to express a lot more in play and in art, where we're not, it's not so language heavy. And so using play with the child, first of all, giving your kid lots of time to play. And then using play, right? So playing out a story, playing out something you might want to talk to him about. We play it if a child's having lots of anxiety around the sirens, lots of anxiety around separating from you to go to school. Can you set up a scene like that with your child's toys and play it out with them? Can you draw a picture about it, or, um, about whatever the situation is? That can often be very helpful for children and also verbal conversations, depending on the age, the child's personality, their strengths. My kids do just want to talk. So giving lots of opportunities for that. If you notice that your kid seems to be struggling to express their thoughts or feelings without prompting, it'd be very um, helpful to give a direct prompt. So for example, pick a quiet moment, sit your kid down at the table with some art materials and ask them, like, how do you feel about a particular event? It's really helping them along. Again, like we said earlier, that the repeated themes and or stories and play, art, verbal conversations, those are normal. It's a child's way of trying to sort of wrap their head around things they really can't wrap their head around. So a lot for them. Next, um, proactively engage in regulating activities with children. So this goes back to the idea we just spoke about earlier, right? About trauma being something that overwhelms an intern a person's internal coping skills. So if we can increase our children's coping skills, they can inherently find the situation less overwhelming. So there's so many wonderful resources online. So, and I think a lot of what Dr. Lee Woods Levy shared can be um, used with young children as well. So just went over this very briefly, but thinking about engaging activities to support kids in naming emotions, developing coping skills, and regulating strong feelings. So things like a feeling chart to name emotions can be really helpful. There's so many free ones that you can find online reading social stories about different feelings. So it's like a story that just explores different feelings can be a great way to teach kids. Um, I don't know for Hebrew speaking books, I know for English um, books, there's a lot of like read alouds on YouTube, like people reading different children's stories. Um, so often with clients. So that's just a great way, a, a free way to expose your child to um, different social stories about emotions. Uh, Movement-based activities can really help with emotional regulation when we have a strong emotional response, um, we the fight or flight response, and we have a lot of that adrenaline. So some movement-based activities can be helpful. Breathing activities can be really helpful. Um, overall, do with my own children, what I do with uh, my child clients is young age, 
this, I talk to kids, ask them like, what's going to help you? And I'm always amazed by how much kids know. And it's going to join, the younger they are, the more it's a joint um, activity. But it can be really beneficial. Like create a list with kids. Like what's going to help you when you feel worried, when you feel scared, when it's really hard for you to go to sleep at night? Let's think of three things that you can do to help yourself. And sometimes, many times, kids have really amazing ideas. Um, and I'll often suggest activities as well. Things like hugging a stuffed animal, taking deep breaths, remembering all the helpers that are working hard to keep them safe, davening tashim, et cetera. Um, so we're thinking pretty simple. That butterfly hug, um, I love that technique. It can be used for young children as well. So really helping a child, like creating their personal toolkit. Um, I think it's just a wonderful activity for parents and kids to do together and super helpful because then you know what to draw upon when they're feeling a specific way. Like you and your child set this contract, if you will, like when I'm feeling anxious, this is what helps. Okay. So as we were talking about before, the stress responses are normal. It's normal for children to regress a bit developmentally. This is incredibly frustrating, particularly when you've got so much going on. Um, but it's normal. And so, and as much as you can find it in yourself, be patient with those stress responses, provide reassurance and strategies. So try and stay neutral. If your kid's returning to earlier behaviors, if they're sucking their thumb, they've started bedwetting, it doesn't mean that they've regressed completely, that they've lost skills. It means they're having a normal response to an abnormal situation. So providing comfort and reassurance in general, particularly if they're having strong separation anxiety. Um, two books I really love that I highly recommend, available for read alouds on YouTube for free. Um, the book's called The Kissing Hand and the Invisible String. Um, and they're, they can read them for with children as young as three. Um, and they explore ways to stay connected with loved ones, even when you're physically apart. So I think they're really nice for children who are having separation anxiety. Um, really helpful sort of language that you can use with a child. Okay. Um, it's really important is focusing on connection. We are social beings and connection is one of the most important ways that we heal, that we regulate. And it's really common in times of trauma and crisis for people to isolate. It's normal, but we need each other. So, and, and children need parents and anybody when we think about connection. So think about routines and rituals around connection. Think about things that you can build into your family's daily routine, weekly routine. So with your family as a whole, and then with each individual child, right? And this is about building their external supports, building your child's social supports. Okay. And lastly, for children who are separated from a loved one in the IDF, think about whatever you can do to support connection. So again, those books of the Kissing Hand, the Invisible String are wonderful books to read for children in the situation. Um, in as much as father, uncle, loved one, the IDF can accommodate supporting connection and they may not be able to accommodate at all. That's an unfortunate reality. Some um, people in the IDF might be able to accommodate more. So if they can, right, if the child can stay connected, video calls, phone calls, messages, but maintaining that connection in whatever way it can happen is so important for children. And then thinking with kids, how will they feel connected to their loved one, right? Do you want a special picture of you and Abba, right? The special picture of you and uncle when you went on this cool trip together. Is there, you know, Abba's sweatshirt that you love that you can have in your bed with you at night? So whatever it is that will help a child feel connected and sort of those concrete things can be very helpful for young children. Okay, so... The last bit of this presentation that I want to focus on is some sample language of answering difficult questions. So I wrote up some questions that common question kids have and sample language. This is here, sample language. It's not language you have to use. Some of it might not resonate with you. Some of it you barely might not like, might not be relevant for your child. Um, but these are just examples because I find very often when speaking um, with parents, friends, they're not really sure how do we take these really big, complicated topics and explain them to children. Okay, but a couple of things to remember. So always start out by asking kids what they already know about their question. So the kid says, right, mommy, what's a moss? What do you think a moss is? 
Do you think mommy's a rocket going to land in her house? Do you think a rocket will land in our house? And we want to assess for misinformation. We want to know what we need to clarify. And also we want to know, particularly when a child's asking, right, things around safety. We want to know if they've developed a way of coping. So if your child says, you know, all right, mommy's a rocket going to land in her house. You ask them and they say, no, because I'm diving really hard to him. He's going to keep us safe. Wonderful. That's a coping skill that you want to build on. You may not want to guarantee. It definitely won't. But you know that your child is resonating with Tefillah, and you can build on that. Keep your answers short, tailored tailor to your child's developmental level. So think how well they are chronologically, how mature they are, um, and keep your answer tailored to that. Right? Like I said, don't make promises you can't keep around safety, and acknowledge and hold space for complex and strong feelings. So I'm going to go through a couple of questions. Okay. So will terrorists come to our house? Will Abba be safe in the army? Will a rocket land on our house? I'm sure 500 other questions around safety. And so some language you might want to use is, right now there are a lot of scary things that have happened and are happening. You're having a lot of scared and worried thoughts and feelings. So we're naming and normalizing those, the emotions. I'm worried too. Knowledge the adults have those feelings as well. I wish I knew for sure what would happen, but I don't. What I do know is that these are the ways we can keep ourselves safe. And these are the ways that Abba's keeping himself safe. What do you do to keep yourself safe? So we're not making promises, but we're focusing on what is in our control and engaging your child in that conversation. When will I go back to school? I don't know, but I wish I knew. I know you miss school so much. And I know that all the grownups in school miss you. I want to see you. They're working really hard to make sure that all the kids can be safe while they're in school. This goes back with this question. I want to highlight the idea that we share, right? We start with less information. And then if a child needs, we share more. So for some children, this might be enough. Some child, some children might follow up and say, well, why is it not safe to be in school? We might have to give a little bit more. But it definitely start out with less and see. That might be enough for your child. What's a war? So two answers here. One very simple one, particularly for younger children. A war is like a fight between two groups of people. If th your three-year-old asks you that, that may very well be enough. And so always start with less and see if that cuts it. Here's a little bit more of a robust answer. So there are people who live near Israel who made some very unsafe choices and hurt people in Israel. The people in Israel are very upset about these bad choices. The Israeli army is having a fight or a war with these people to make sure they don't hurt, they don't hurt people anymore. We're also davening to Hashem to keep all the people in Israel safe. What is Hamas? So Hamas is a group of people, parentheses I read, who don't, who don't like Jewish people or the country of Israel. Again, start keeping it as simple as possible. If your child will be satisfied with just Hamas as a group of people, made very unsafe and bad choices and hurt a lot of people, I'd go with that. Because talking about the fact that Hamas doesn't like Jewish people, doesn't like the country of Israel, those are complex subjects again children can't grasp many of them will be been exposed to it and so you'll need to speak with your child about it but if your child has not been exposed to it or doesn't write in asking questions about that might leave that out what's a siren in a rocket why do we need to go to the mama um well the water this answer from a great book um by which is dr dr kobernick this is available for free um it's called michael asks, asks ima about the sirens it's available on Hebrew and English. So answer, so siren is a loud sound that is a warning for us. It lets us know there might be a rocket in the sky. A rocket is a piece of metal that can hurt people. We go to the Mahmoud because that's the room that will keep us safe. Rockets don't usually land near our house, but we want to be extra careful and safe. So we go to the Mama. Why does Abba need to go with the other soldiers? Abba used to be a soldier in the Israeli army, and he worked hard to keep the people in Israel safe. After a few years, he stopped being a soldier, and now he does whatever his current job is. But when there's a war, people like Abba, who used to be a soldier, need to go help out the army and work hard to keep all the people in Israel safe. What are hostages? What's happening to the people Hamas took? Hamas made really bad choices and told some people from Israel they have to come with them, even though the people from Israel didn't want to go with them. We're all thinking a lot about the people that Hamas took. We don't know what's happening with them. We're all worried about them opening for them so these are hard questions just 
really thinking about that as I'm reading particularly this one. And we wish we could give our kids answers. I think it's so important that we talked about before, acknowledge when we don't know that it's hard, that we're all worried and that we can delve in. Okay, final question. What does it mean that someone died or was killed? Often when I've shared this with people, I often have very strong response, like visceral responses from adults. I just want to say we have really strong feelings around death and murder, of course, and we have a lot of associations. When young children are asking, it's often very helpful to get as basic as we can and as, as literal as we can so that they understand. When someone dies, their heart stops giving blood to their body and the person's body dies. This means they can't eat or sleep or talk or play or feel anything. People who love the person who died usually feel very sad because they miss the person who died. People die when they get old or very sick and their hearts stop giving blood to their bodies. Killing someone means that a person hurts another person so much that they make the person's heart stop working and the person's body dies. I do wanna add with this particular answer, um, this is an answer I wrote holding in mind that the child is who was asking this doesn't know somebody personal, like very close to them, a died or was killed. Um, a child who has somebody close to them, a loved one, a friend, et cetera, who died or who was killed, this is a part of the answer, but there's obviously gonna need to be a lot more support that that child needs and have a lot more follow-up questions. Okay. All right, so then very final thoughts. Um, I think that it's so important to hold in mind um, with all this heaviness. We are resilient people, Israel, Israeli people, the Jewish people. Um, we're resilient. And I, so I was putting the slides together and was just thinking how to conclude. We wanted to like find something about this idea. And I found this really amazing book that I'm all listening to an audiobook called um, Is Resilience. And it's written by these two authors who are really looking at the incredible resilience within the people of Israel. And they just have these really, two really nice quotes that I want to read. So this is a theory. Israelis have this amazing ability to carry on. There's a still in their spirit. There's a metal that's waiting to be tested. There's something in their DNA that pushes them forward, despite all the various adversities they face. From Michael Dixon, one of the authors, and from the other author, Naomi Baum. So Baum speaks about the notion of bouncing forward. So when you bounce forward, you take everything that you've learned from this very difficult experience and you use it in your life and you move forward. Okay. All right, so I'm going to stop sharing. And maybe we have some questions. Uh, I think we have a few questions in the Q&A. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Okay, so I see one question, which is a double question. Mm -hmm. uh, so what if you talk to your child and they seem to shut down? Mm -hmm. Right? The child, during their shutdown, they're going to form their own narrative and hold things inside, um, probably usually the wrong version of what's necessary, what's going on. Um, I guess the second part of that question, um, well, young adults who can't process a crisis also can shut down as well. Yeah, yeah. So, so really, during shutdown, if a child is in shutdown, meaning they can either walk into their room, disappear, they can be on the couch, immersed in their own their own world, and they refuse to even talk or discuss what is going on, which is a form of which is a form of shutdown. You know, when you just totally block everything out as if it doesn't exist. Um, is there a way to talk to these children yeah. during that time? Excellent question. Um, and, and super common. Shutting down is a really, really common stress response. Um, so I think something really important to hold in mind is that when a child is shut down, that is not the time to talk to them. And it can be very frustrating if you know that your child, that the young adult is forming, holding on to a narrative that's incorrect. And it's important to talk with them. But when we are having an emotional response and shutdown is a very strong emotional response, we don't have access to the logical thinking part of our brains. It's true for children, adults, all of us, right? Think about when you're really angry, anxious, sad, shut down as an adult, and somebody tries to talk logic to you, 
you'll get frustrated, it won't resonate, you'll ignore them. So when your child, whatever age, when your spouse, a friend, this is true for all ages, when you notice somebody shut down and you want to support them, those are that's a time to think about coping skills, reassurance, comfort. So it depends, of course, on the child and what your, right, what your relationship is with them, how old they are. If it's a four-year-old, it's a lot easier to just pick them up and give them a hug. A 14-year-old may not be as receptive to that. Um, but thinking about how can you provide reassurance and regulation before you talk with them? So what's something that resonates with that child? If you can get them to move, that is one of the greatest things that you can do to help to move dad or that shutdown. The shutdown is like that paralyzed state. So if you can get them to move their bodies in whatever way, um, there's a lot of fun movement videos for young children. Online. Do fun exercise video with a teenager if you can do something right. So if you can get any sort of movement, that's a very good way to get them out of shutdown. But sometimes that won't resonate. So any sort of reassurance, any comfort, say for somebody that's shut down, that's what I'd really be focusing on a lot. And then hopefully that decreases the shutdown and then you can talk with them. The other thing I would also think about um, with people who are sort of in a more extended um, state of shutdown, you're concerned about the wrong narrative, um, I would share very, very little bits, one or two sentences. So somebody who shut down or if you feel right, like you can provide all the coping skills and strategies, but you also know simultaneously that they need to be, they need to hear the narrative. Um, the shutdown is an indication of their systems overwhelmed. So we don't want to overwhelm them more. So providing like little tiny bits of information, they may be able to take that in. Okay. Um, okay. So the social stories. Okay, she wants somebody wants you to be able to share the links. I don't know how to figure that out. Um, and what was the name of that free ebook that you mentioned? Again, was it Michal talks to Ema about the sirens? That could be. I that's what it is. If um, it's so it's called the CBT DBT Center. Um, I believe that Epic Families has a link to that on their website, um, but they have some nice free resources available for children right now related to the war, Hebrew and English. There's one related to a child whose father's called up, called up in the reserves. So that's a great resource. Um, somebody asked if you were able to share that answer again of uh, the war. What is war? Sure. I'm not going to share my screen just because that's cumbersome, but I will read the answer. Just okay. So, really short answer thinking about with the young children is a war is like a fight between two groups of people. A little bit more robust is there are people who live near Israel who made some very unsafe choices and hurt people in Israel. The people in Israel are very upset about these bad choices. The Israeli army is having a fight or a war with these people to make sure they don't hurt people anymore. We're also diving to Hashem to keep all the people in Israel safe. Hi. Um, last question that was in the mm -hmm. Q&A was, um, how do you talk to someone who's very angry, like a very a child who's extremely angry? Sometimes you, it's not necessarily in shutdown, but a very anxious child, when you um, try to talk to them about a particular subject, you know, they can give you a response like, ah, I don't want to hear what's going on. Um, I don't want to know what's going on. I definitely don't want to talk about my feelings um, because it just brings up too much anxiety and too much fear within them. Is there a tool that a parent can use pre-approaching the subject? Meaning understanding says, hey, like, you know, for instance, like, I know you're very anxious right now, or I know you're having feelings that are very difficult for you to discuss. And I get it. And I'm there with you. You know, because, but sometimes you have to approach the subject. For instance, when you're going to taking a child, let's say here in Beit Shemesh, where we have, where the kids have school, and you can have a situation where they're going to school and a situation where a siren can go off on their way to school. So you can have those moments or when they're in school, they don't feel as safe as they would if they were home. So you want to have these pre-discussions with these children yeah. um, beforehand, what they can do in order to minimize their fears. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. So with young children, very common. And the best thing you can do is play art or books. Um, it, it allows the conversation to be one step removed. So if you're going to read a book with a child, say the book, Michal, here's the siren. It's not about this kid. It's not about your child. It's about Michal. And if the child starts saying, I don't want to talk about sirens here. So we're not going to talk about the sirens here. I just want to tell you about Michal. You know what happened to her? Just want to talk to you about Michal. They'll be taking it in. They'll, they'll get it. Um, so displacing it can be very helpful for young children, playing it out, right? pick up a little character and say, give the, you know, give a little character a name that is not your child's name and say, right, this is Shlomo and Shlomo has gone to school and here's his school and here's his gone and here's his Mora and Shlomo doesn't like to say bye to his mommy and Shlomo worries there's going to be a siren. And do you want to be the mommy in the story? Do you want to be the Mora? So get really playful, get into it with your kid and have it not be about your kid. Um, it is often the most helpful way to talk with your child and they're going to get it. They'll internalize this. That's really one of the very things of play therapy. Very common therapy for young children is that it allows the child to displace it right onto an another so that we can sort of bypass some of those anxious defenses. It doesn't feel that scary because I don't need to talk about me, but you've had the conversation with them. And then you can even say, right, let's just say in the story, you're playing out Shlomo going to Gaon and what might happen if you're driving to Gaon? What does Shlomo need to do if he drives to Gaon? And how Shlomo going to keep himself safe? And then maybe as you're leaving your, your house, if you be direct with your child, it feels necessary. You might even just say, hey, remember Shlomo and what he did to keep himself safe? We're going to do that too. So if you need, if it feels important, depending on the situation to tie it back to your child, you can reference that. I think really having the conversation through books, through play, through art about other children can be really effective. So I'd like to ask you another question, if I may. Sure. I, it's kind of the opposite of what we just discussed. So you have the children to go into the anxious mode where they just don't want to hear what's going on like we just discussed. So we talk about the others. What if we have the child who does the exact opposite, who refuses to accept that something bad is going on and I'm going out to play, whether you like it or not. I want to go to the park. I want to be outside. I want to go, you know, in a different place where they were allowed to previously, like in some places in the apartment complexes, may have a park right down the block, which is, you know, walk, you know, where they don't have the child, doesn't have to cross the street or anything. It's the end of the parking lot, there's a park. So we let them go. But now is not the time to allow that to happen without supervision, because you never know what could happen, a crisis could happen. And even a teenager where you have no control over in a you know you know effective control over I should say, um, and they're just going to go out and go out with their friends. How do we approach the subject in that sense in order to keep them safe and to keep yourself um, from being being uh, go cuckoo? That's yeah, great question. Polite, polite way of saying it. Yes. Um, great question. I want to differentiate here between young children and teenagers um, because I think young children, we do have more control over where they are walking to some degree, right? And teens, we don't. So I think there's some differentiation. Um, but I think overall, whatever the age, really important to hold in mind that denial is a really, really common stress response. It's actually a person's way of saying the situation is so overwhelming. It's so terrible. I can't wrap my head around it. The best thing I can do is pretend it's not happening. It, it doesn't work, of course, for safety. But just know that there's nothing wrong with your child. There's nothing wrong with your teenager. Your teenager is not stupid. They know what's going on. It's just they hate it. It's so hard and scary that the only way right now they know how to cope is by saying it's not going on. So bigger picture, this is, doesn't directly address your question, I'll get to that in a minute, but I think the important to remember is that a child who is in such significant denial, right, doesn't feel that they have the coping skills 
to handle what's going on. So just thinking about how we can help them build coping skills. Um, I think with young children, this is an important time to remember that we're going to be be kind, we be empathic, and we say, I'm the grown-up who knows right now about safety. You know you wish you could go to the park, and it's not safe. So we want to, in a very kind way, acknowledge their feelings and sell them. I'm not going to like it, but that's important. And then I think part B of that is helping the child, saying this is so frustrating, so terrible, so yucky. What can you do instead? I want to go to the park. Do you have a lot of energy? How can we get your energy out in another way? Is it something else that you want to try to think with your child? What's next best? They might have a very strong response, might throw a tantrum. That's normal, right? This is not an ideal situation for anybody. Nobody likes it. And unfortunately, we can't fix that. Um, but I think both, right? So holding in mind the limit that you need to set with your child, um, with your younger child, and then thinking like, okay. So if this is the limit and I'm not going to change my mind because I'm the grown up and I do know what's safest right now, what can we do? What's next best? So that's with a young child where you have more control. Um, with teenagers or, or sometimes even <clears throat> at older elementary school where the child is going to do what they're going to do. Um, I think that's a little more complex. And I think that, so this is going to speak very broadly. And I think it's one of those situations that it's going to be a little bit like case specific. And this can be helpful if this is happening um, to speak with somebody who, who you know, who knows your child, um, somebody that you trust who can maybe just give you specific guidance, because I think it's holding in mind safety while we're up, restrain your child. Um, so I think a couple of important themes to hold in mind with a child like that is that if the child can tolerate it, it can be helpful to tell them that denial is a common stress response. So in a very, not accusatory, in a very gentle way, saying it's a lot simpler. It feels a lot nicer to pretend that everything is normal right now, right? It's a lot nicer to think I can go hang out with my friends just the way I did before sex. I also wish I could think that. And we can't because it's not what's happening, right? There are safety concerns. Um, so thinking about how to introduce that to your child and then thinking about sort of like sort of minimizing the risks. So thinking with your child, if your child's going to go out of the house, right, can you talk to them about safety? Can you say, I don't want you to go out of the house, but if you're going to, what steps can you take? Um, I, the first thing I really should have said when talking with a child who's going to make their own choices, because I think this is the biggest thing is regulating yourself. This is such an incredibly scary time. I think everybody's feeling vulnerable and parents feel more vulnerable. And when we, when kids get older and we can't choose where they go, it's an increased vulnerability. So to hold in mind how scary this time is and that these conversations I think are important to have with the child, right? Highlighting that they might be in denial, thinking with them around safety, but it's only gonna be a meaningful conversation if you're regulated. So how, and really, it's how do you regulate yourself? Like again, to Dr. Lee Woods Levy's presentation of what are you doing to regulate yourself? In that conversation, and maybe you can't because you're just so terrified. And so maybe your spouse is the one who talks with your child, or somebody else, right? Who can talk with your child? But if you're not regulated enough, you're not going to get anywhere. It's just going to be likely a screaming match, power struggle, all those things that happen. Um, so really thinking about regulation. Um, so now you have a situation where there's an adult um, who is acting as if, you know, I don't need to go into the safe room or I don't need to be in a place of safety, for instance. And it could be whether it's, you know, the sirens going off, so they decide they want to find, see where the rocket is going, they want to film it. Or in other locations in the world right now where there are riots going on in some places or there are, um, you, instead of being indoors where it's safe and, and you know, to keep people from, you know, an extra riots. So they go outside, they want to be and, and you know, be 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 in the forefront to see what's going on. So now you have a child. I mean, you can't control the adult who is doing, you know, behavior of that, you know, they talk to them nicely and say, you know, maybe we shouldn't do this around the children. But now the child asks you in return. But daddy's doing this. 
or you know the older brother or the older sister is doing this why can't i mm -hmm. yeah so that's an, another type of question that we have to like sometimes get to this is like yeah yeah and that's a hard one um let's say if you are if your spouse is doing something you disagree with right if you and your spouse are sort of disagreeing on some basic safety rules that's going to be incredibly challenging for the two of you and for your children. And I think there has to be some way that parents have an agreement about what safety they do around children. Because there's lots of answers we can give to kids when it's not parents, and we'll get to that in a moment. But if, right, if mommy's, if Ima's saying we go into the Mamad, and I was going to, um, out to film the rockets, then that leaves a child incredibly confused. And so I think that is setting up a child for a lot of stress and confusion. So I think so parents need to figure out, need to be able to come to some sort of compromise of what do we do around children? If it's an older sibling, a neighbor, cousin, whoever, um, I'm going to keep things pretty simple. I'd say, right, this is the rule in our family. This is what we believe is safe. I wish older brother would do it. I think neighbor should go to his mom lot. But they're making their choices, and this is the choice that we make for our family. So keep it really simple. This is a choice for our family. This is a choice our family makes because we think it's safest. Um, if there's anybody else that has a question, please send it in right now. Um, otherwise, Esther, I want to say thank you very much for giving up. Uh, you know, Sunday in the U.S. is uh, very <laughs> special. You know, we don't Glad get too many here. days here. Uh, if we're lucky, we get a Friday and we get to walk in the park. But um, if we have time for that. But uh, again, I want to thank you very much for giving up your time and your Sunday. And another question just came in. Let's see. Uh, I guess your contact information. I'll send that out. Okay. Um, and let's see. How um, yeah, uh, second. That didn't work. Um, we'll put that over here. These things sometimes are very confusing. Okay. Um, <clears throat> okay, so I think uh, that's uh, been a very, very eye-opening and uh, helpful uh, experience, for especially talking to, you know, different children, different ages. Um, you know, when they're showing specifically, I guess, uh, one of the you know, things to look for would be anger, extra anger during situations of, you know, a crisis uh, at any point. I think that would be a sign of a child showing um, I'm not I'm not feeling safe at the present moment during mm -hmm. this situation. Um, I guess there would be uh, more difficult ways of talking to them during that time. I mean, I guess if uh, if a child is displaying anger, which is not typical for this particular child, um, so you know it has to do with the situation at hand and the crisis that they're going. What would be the best way to co-regulate with them, or to calm mm -hmm. them down in in a situation? Yeah, good question. So, first thing I would say is, if you have the opportunity when your child is not angry, I'd have a conversation with them. Like, what helps you when you're angry? And often, like sharing with kids when I have conversations with them about feelings like this is what helps me I don't have to get very personal um don't get very personal <laughs> it's helpful for kids think about things that they might relate to so let's just say you know when I'm angry I have a lot of energy in my body and I like to do push-ups I like to run for a bit um right so if you can to speak with your child beforehand um so then you have a sense don't always have the opportunity for that. Anger is a really common response. Um, so in regards to the regulation piece, 
this gets back to right, regulate yourself. So know what helps you when your child is angry. That's the best thing you can do. And then a couple of things that often help kids. Um, very often when children are feeling angry, they're having some sort of like fight response in their body and they're getting a lot of adrenaline. So if you can get them to do any sort of movement-based activity, that can be really helpful. If you can make it silly and playful, that's great. Or if you can say, hey, can you do 25 jumping jacks? I see, can you do like five push-ups with perfect form? Whatever it is, um, if you can get them to do that, that can often be a really great way to turn down the dial a bit on the anger. Um, the younger the child is, the more often they respond to physical affection, even older kids. So often when kids are having strong feelings, adults too, I'm just like, can I give you a hug? Can I give you a back rub? Do you want to squeeze my hand? Um, I find that to be the best responses. And that's hard because if your child's angry, if your five-year-old just kicked you, the last thing you want to do is hug them. Um, right. So that, go back, that goes back to the regulation piece of what regulates you. Um, but if you can find it in yourself, really when you can find it in yourself, oftentimes giving your child a hug is just the best way to refuse things, picking them up. They're young enough to do that. Um, can be really powerful for just about all emotions or social beings. Okay. Thank you so much, Esther. Thank you everybody for joining us. And uh, if you have any other questions, feel free to send it by what you know, send it our way. You can uh, send us an email to colonshamot at gmail.com. And we will forward over all questions and hope to answer all questions in the in whenever you send them. Thank you again, Esther, very much for joining us. We really appreciate your time. And I was able to join. Thank you, everyone, for participating. Okay. Yeah. Have a good night. Thank you. Okay.